I'll be remembered probably you But when God was the baddest that I would turn to CEO with the shit that's a dumb motherfucker He always win There's no going under The top of the crown resting on his head The beast is alive He'll never be dead If he drunk before Bring it back to life Push harder for it Let us survive Show courage and strength It's okay to be scared But don't let it stop You always stay prepared Bill show my school They're just not beginning Winners fucking win losers Talk about winning Welcome to the Bearded Beast Show. My name is Bill, and I am the Bearded Beast. I have a special guest here today, founder, owner, and head instructor of Elite Martial Arts in Toronto, my friend, Dan Novak. How are you, Dan? I'm doing very good, Bill. Happy to be on the show. Uh, I'm excited uh, to have you on. I know uh, we've been trying to put it together for a little while, but life sometimes gets in the way. It's good to be busy, though, right? Yeah, always better to be busy than to be uh, be slow, and uh, times are locked in. We had a couple of years of that, so I'm always happy for anything I can do to just keep things going, keep things moving forward. So, And as I told you, I, I've been uh, listening to a lot of this show since you started it. I think you're doing a great job. I'm happy to be part of it today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, yep. Can you, can you give my listeners a little bit of a background about yourself? We're going to get into some things, you know, some questions I have for you, which will, sure. which will really display a lot of that. But just just give them a brief background of who you are and what you do. Sure. Well, like you said, you know, my name is Dan Novak. I'm the owner and head instructor, founder of Elite Martial Arts Toronto, uh, which is a Krav Maga school. Uh, Krav Maga and Motai is what we teach up here in Toronto, Ontario. And I started that school uh, 10 years ago. And through that school, I've had just some great opportunities come into my lifetime. Uh, just the nature of that kind of career. Uh, I've met some great people. I've traveled the world for training and fighting. Uh, spent a lot of time in Thailand. Uh, the Motai program with the John Stuchart, my instructor, uh, that that's really opened up a lot of doors for me. So I'm also currently serving as the president of the Canadian Nakatoma Association. And uh, I'm on the board of directors for Martial Arts International Union for the Krav Maga Division. So I'm also in charge of that. So that's mainly teaching standards for instructors. So there's a lot of instructors that I teach and certify and they have schools in various parts of Canada and USA. And a lot of the students that I've taught over the years, they've gone on to have their own schools. And I just kind of oversee how they're doing. I'm there to help them when they need me. They can email me any questions they have about running their schools, uh, provide lesson plans for them and criteria, curriculum. So really, as I think I'm kind of entering the second half of my career, I'm, I'm kind of focusing you know, on kind of setting things up for the next generation, right? So... I always said I would probably do this for about 20 years, and I'm 10 years in. And I'll be 53 in the 10-year mark, uh, 10 more years, and I'll see if I want to keep going after that. But, uh, yeah, I definitely feel like I'm entering phase two now with some other goals in mind. And, and you mentioned something there pretty, pretty briefly. I hope people picked up on it. But, you know, as entrepreneurs, it is our, kinda, it is our job to, like, um, set the next generation of people up for success, right? Yeah, that, that's very true. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I always keep an eye out, like, you know, for example, when I'm teaching classes, like, you know, sometimes I'll see somebody in, in the classroom that really is kind of standing out. And, you know, more often than not, it's actually me approaching someone going, hey, you know, you, you have the intangibles. Have you ever thought about doing this? And, and if they're interested, then, you know, I kind of help them out and I kind of invite them to the courses. And from there, I basically love teaching people how to teach that. That's a different skill. You know, you can have somebody that, is an excellent martial artist and they can just beat up on everybody or you put them in the ring and they're a great champion. And then you put them in front of the room in front of 30, 40 people and to get the skill of what I know, give it to you. And now you can do it. That's a totally different skill set, right? So I, I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of taking people that I think would be good and then watching them reach that potential. And yeah, cause I'm not going to be able to do this forever. And I'd like to be able to have something to leave to the next generation and so on and so forth. And, I don't mean to be cheesy, but that's really how martial arts stays alive. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and I, I try to teach this to my employees, right? Because, you know, owning a business like I do, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be alive forever either, right? So I want somebody mm -hmm. to encompass that same thing that I have and to eventually maybe take that over and continue the growth of it, but the growth of themselves as well, because we, we are going to be around forever, nor do we sometimes maybe want to do that forever. Maybe we want to venture into something else. Yeah, like uh, it's a good point you bring that up. Uh, like I said, the school's been around now 10 years. We're coming up on our 10-year anniversary in June, at the end of June. And uh, I do know that, <laughs> you know, we throw those school parties and, and you know, I, I throw uh, different events for the school. This is just such a good community and it's good for us to get some time together outside the mats. 
So, you know, when we do belt testing for Krav, when that's done, black belt testing, someone takes a Motai fight. Uh, I have one of my best instructors. He's a great guy. He's moving to Ottawa at the end of the month. So I go, hey, I'll throw you a send-off, right? Send-off party for him next month. And when you see the community get together and, you know, they're all having fun. And I've seen people hook up. I've had people get married. People have kids all from that school. Wow. And sometimes I just sit there and I look at the crowd and, and I'm like, how do I walk away from this? <laughs> like, I love yeah. this too. And you know, you know, like I couldn't imagine just writing an email in the middle of the night. Hey, everybody, I'm I'm retired now. Like, it's not going to go down that way. And I, I think I'm going to have a passion for this for a long time. Well, I so think, the fire's not going to go out. But I think uh, people, yeah, there's other parts of life. I think people like you and I, right? I mean, I like to consider myself a high level individual because that's how I, I try to live my life and everything that I do. But high level individuals mm-hmm. probably just never retire. We're always going to have to have our hands in something, right? We're, we're, we got, I feel like I need to wake up with a purpose, right? And for me to just sit on a beach somewhere sipping a Muay Thai might not be that purpose that's going to fulfill me. I'll probably always need to have my hands in something, doing something, waking up and just feeling like I have that purpose. Now, you bring up some good points, and I agree with you, and that's what I'm saying. I've really enjoyed listening to the show. If people are listening to this show, I highly encourage you to click on some other shows and, and give some other guests and shows a listen because I, I love the content on, on the show you're doing. So well, one thing you brought up just now, it, you know, you won't be able to sit around and do nothing. I, I think uh, just being a lifelong pursuer of education, and I don't necessarily mean going to school. I mean, like, learning skills, learning different things – we're here one shot in life, as far as I know. <laughs> you only live once. Yep. And I, I enjoy learning as much as I can. And if there's something that piques my interest, you know, I take it upon myself where, like, you know, I want to learn that. And in my head, I always feel like I can do anything, whether I can or I can't. Uh, you know, a good example, like when I first started going to Thailand for training and working, uh, when I, John put a partnership with the government of Thailand to get some teaching standards from the Thai government and bring them over to North America with Canada, USA, and Mexico. Uh, I was part of the group representing Canada that went over there. And it really bothered me that I couldn't speak the language and that I didn't know mm-hmm. what was going on or what was said when I'd go to meetings. And a few of the John's guys uh, that had lived there as, as champions and as fighters, they, they could speak. And I was really impressed by that. I had no idea. And I was like, how did you learn that? And I'm like, I know you lived here and you were fighting here for quite a while, but the fact you picked it up, that's impressive because it's not related to English, right? They're not close languages. Like, French and Spanish and English, they all kind of come from that Latin background. You can pick that up, but it ties unique. So, you know, just through knowing a John, I knew a bit, but I really took it upon myself to learn some basics so I could get by. And I just sat there every day trying to learn and using Google Translate. And people I met in Thailand, I'm like, what does this mean? Then they would tell me, how do I say this? And then I started piecing sentences together. And then I became functional, right? Like, I wouldn't say I'm bilingual in it, but that's just a good example of lifelong learning. Right. Right. There's so many things we can do instead of just sitting and doing nothing. And believe me, there's a time to do nothing. And like, you know, downtime is important too to recharge the batteries. And, you know, I I try to have a good balance. But yeah, like you, I I don't think I could just do absolutely nothing all the time. That would, I I would just kind of wither away. Yeah. And I agree with you. There is a time we do need to, you know, charge the batteries a little bit. But I feel like for me, that'll come when I don't know what's what's after this life. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm looking and I can feel and I can see the one that I have right now. And I just need to, to try and be the most productive person I can, not just for myself, but for my family and for the future generations like we talked about to come. Like when when you talk about leaving a legacy, it's, it's not for me. I don't want people to I'm not I'm not trying to create this stuff so people you know, I, I can feel like I'm better than anyone, but I, I feel like I need <laughs> yeah. to leave some stuff behind for future generations to learn from. Mm-hmm. So, oh, you know, I had, keep doing the, the th- I had a question for you about Thailand. And sure. I know this is kind of off topic, but you got to yeah, tell no me, how's the food? The food is awesome. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've always grown up with a good palate when I was a kid. My parents were like, you know, you got to try everything at least once. Even though I didn't want to eat it. And I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And so I was never a picky eater, and I was told to try everything. And so by the time I got there as an adult, like I, I already love Thai food. And <laughs> like I said, being friends with the John Suchart and learning from him, he's, he's actually a Thai chef by trade. Oh, wow. I, rem- I remember uh, what, like the second lesson I learned with him 
in one of his old clubs, he, he had a, a kitchenette in the gym it, and I just finished a workout with him. It, and then he starts cooking up like in the gym and I could smell the food. And I'm like, Dude, this is killing me. Like, like I just worked out and I can smell this food. And I'm like, what are you doing? And then I went over and I didn't really know him that well. So I didn't want to like, po- at the time I did, I didn't want to poke my head right in the pot and see what he's up to. <laughs> yeah. But it, it was really impressive what he was cooking over there. And, uh, yeah, I, I've really been into that diet and, you know, I know you're friends with me on Facebook and I, I'm always posting like when I can cook something and, uh, yeah, I, I don't find it that complicated to make. It's a good cuisine. It's pretty healthy too. the ingredients in there and the food over in Thailand. The funny thing is unless you tell them you can handle spice, they will make it like you're a tourist. <laughs> okay. Right. And cause, cause they don't want you to be running to the bathroom yep. right after you eat. So you, you got to tell them that you can handle spice and, and then they'll give it to you. Right. And, and it's always funny when I go to order, I, I always try to speak Thai that throws them off even more. So if I tell them in Thai, <laughs> You know, the spice is fine and I can handle it. Then then they'll pretty much give me what I want. So far, it's been all good. I would be so curious to see how it is compared to what, you know, the Thai food we have in, in the States here. Well, I can tell you exactly how it is, right? When you're going over there, the ingredients is, is a, a beautiful, fresh, because it's right there. And they'll have stuff in the food that you just can't get in Canada and the USA. And Thai food in Canada, the mm-hmm. USA, even the really good restaurants where I take a bite and I'm like, oh, that's really authentic, very good. I still know that they're dumbing it down, for lack of a better term. Like they're, they're still catering it to North American palate, oh, okay. right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you'll catch it. Like my favorite Thai restaurant right now, there's a family that owns a restaurant just coincidentally down the street from where I am. I was going, they had one location in downtown Toronto I was going to, and uh, they make a, a dish called lap chicken. And, and lap is very hard to find. Not a lot of restaurants have it. They had it. And I ate it. I'm like, man, this is just like back over there. And then the family opened a restaurant coincidentally down the street from where I'm living now. And I was so happy. And But uh, I, I was always ordering that dish. And then finally, I learned how to make it myself. And so the last couple of rounds have been on me. I've been cooking it. But uh <clears throat> yeah, the the food is excellent. You can get tons of it for not too much money. So that's another really cool thing. When you go there, if you ever go there, you know, be be super respectful to the people. They're glad you're there. Tourism is a big part of it, but it's their country, their home. And when I go there, it, you know, I'm very polite and I'm very appreciative. And I, I know that our dollar is, is worth more and I, I want to help their community and their economy and, yep. and they depend <clears throat> on it. And you just try to be the best guest you can, whether it's enjoying the beaches, enjoying the scenery, spending time with, for me, spending time with people I know there and, and, and training is fun and, and just take advantage of all that has to offer. And it's a great place. I'm trying to get a group uh, of my staff and some of my students next year on crew day, crew means teacher in Thai. So like they do like a national teacher's day and uh, I'm trying to get them over there. It'd be good to have maybe a fighter to show up there and, and do an exhibition. That'd be fun. So yeah. We'll see, but I, I'm there frequently. I, I'm there at least a couple of times a year. So let's talk Krav Maga for a second. Sure, yeah. Um, don't know how many how many of my listeners are actually familiar with it. You want to explain what it is? Yeah, Krav Maga is a self defense system that was developed uh, by Amy Litchfield, and it's been adapted and used primarily through the Israeli Defense Forces, and then. Uh, in North America, it's been widely, widely accepted and adapted as the primary self defense method for law enforcement. Uh, for me, I used to be a corrections officer 15 years, and that's kind of how I got into it. And what I really find with Krav Maga, the client telling the people you're getting for Krav, and I know you, you've had your school before and you've <clears> been <throat> instructing in Krav. That's how I know you. Yep. Um, it, you know, the clientele you get for Krav is typically people that have done other martial arts their lifetime. They're, so they're they're always been interested in martial arts, but they maybe got in a real fight, a street fight, and got their butts kicked. And like, man, that was nothing like what I – I didn't square off. There was no rap for like, you know, if it didn't go on the ground, I didn't know what to do. You know, uh, like if you're – and I love martial arts, so I'm not knocking any martial art. But one thing I, I do love about Krav is that it covers everything. Like I'm not a jujitsu master at all, but if you dump me on the ground, I can be functional. I can fight standing up. I mean, the motai helps for that, but my stand-up's good. I, I can function on the ground. But if there's multiple attackers, situational awareness, uh, all those X factors in a fight, like what can be a weapon, being aware of your surroundings. Like, you know, I can walk around and 
you know, see, see things differently than I think other people would where, you, you know, you see weapons and ordinary objects that would be highly effective to end a threat end a threat. I, I think Rob is an amazing system. Yeah. The a si- huge advocate for it. The situational awareness is, is one of the things that I taught a lot at my school, right? I would put my students mm-hmm. in certain scenarios where they would have to try to find a weapon that they could use. And it, and lots of times it's just stuff that we wouldn't even imagine could be a weapon, but when you train mm-hmm. yourself to sit, be situationally aware and look around and pay attention to what's going on around you, there's a lot of things that you could use in an, in an instance of, if something was to get a little bit out of control. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that because I don't think a lot of people understand. And especially today, the world's getting a little bit crazier, right? Um, it is. We need to kind of be paying attention to what's going on around us. You know, and I, when I go to restaurants with my family, I'm always making sure I don't have my back to the door. I'm always can pay. I can pay attention to what's going on. I can see people coming and going, and um, and and you know, you know, that, you know, might you know be, that might be a little crazy. But go ahead and call me crazy because I don't think it is. I think the world's getting a little crazy, and we need to pay attention. No, I think you're right. And when I teach seminars, and, and like you know, my students get me every day, so they're used to my lessons and what I teach. Uh, when I teach seminars, that's when I, I talk about the same sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, you know, I always tell people like, you know, live your life where you're aware of things, but don't be squirrely. Don't be nervous. Just be intelligent. Like what you're saying, you know, where you want to sit yourself in a restaurant where you might want to position yourself. I I know in Toronto, as a beautiful city as we are, the funny thing is, and I know you can probably attest to this because you're American, you've been up and you probably expect in the first time you've been to Canada and to Toronto specifically, you probably thought, oh, you know, the stereotype, everybody's going to be nice. It's going to be beautiful, going to be clean. (laughs) Then you get up there and we got a big problem with homeless and junkies yeah i got in a fight with I, one I'm sure, yeah I, I mean like we got we got the bridge people going on and for the most part they just it's just mental illness they're not going to attack you and i tell people i'm like look even if that dude did attack you he probably hasn't eaten for about seven days he's probably exactly. starving malnourished and but he could have super crazy strength and that's different from you right right uh but you know, one thing too that 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 Krav does that I think is really cool and kind of funny backstory. Um, Krav teaches us to go for vulnerable parts of the body, where it doesn't matter if you're a six foot five, three hundred pound beast bodybuilder or you're my size, where I'm only five six. I'm not very big. It, you know, like if you go for targets like the growing, the throat, the eyes, even popping people like right in the nose, right on the button, right off the start. I don't matter. I just matter how big you are. If I got my hands up and I'm telling you, hey, man, chill out. I don't want to fight you. But my hands are up and I'm in the interview stance, like open hand stance. A dude gets in my space. I don't want to fight you. I told you to step back. And the person keeps walking forward. If you pop them one right in the nose, first thing they do, if that's your first shot, the hand's going to come up to the face automatically. Mm-hmm. That opens up that growing kick. That bends them over. They bend over. Then you got the hammer fist in the back of the skull. I mean, it, it's a pretty violent to the point fighting style. And I remember. The backstory I was going to tell you is I, when I did my first Krav class, I pulled up, uh, I, I looked up Krav Maga that was around me and I got very lucky because the instructor, this guy, Steve McCullough, who's one of my best friends now coming to my school next month for a seminar. The guy is just like a human weapon. He is awesome. Like he, he's one of the only guys I've met over the years where I look at him and I'm like, I want nothing to do with fighting that guy. And I, like, you know, I know his real life stories. I, the guy's a phenomenal martial artist. I pull up to his school. I, I never met him at that time. He pulls up, gets the key to his school, goes in. So I'm like, that must be the guy. So usually people make an appointment. They talk to the instructor first. I, I just went. I've been taking martials my whole life. I, I walk up to him. I go, hey, I, you must be the owner. He's like, yeah. I go, cool. I go, uh, you know, I'm here for a class right on. So he teaches me a karate choke. I, I still remember the technique. He teaches me a karate choke. And there's no wrestling out of it. The first thing you do is slide your hip out of the way, expose the groin, ridge, ridge hand strike to the groin, work your way out, you know, shoulder check, work your way out, 45 control, control and combatives, right? Mm-hmm. And I feel naive saying this, and I, I say this when I teach a women's self-defense course. We got a lot of ladies training at my school, and I go, this sounds naive in 2023 to say, but this was when I was 25, which it's like 17 years ago. I, I, I go to 18 years ago, actually. I, I go to Steve, and this is just me being naive back then. I go, hey, hey, man. I He's like, yeah. I, I go, why am I doing that? He's like, well, why are you doing what? I go, why am I hitting him in the growing? He's like, what do you mean? And this is just total stupidness. Now that I look back on it, <laughs> I go, well, I'm a guy. I go, I'm a guy. I, I go, like, we don't really – do that like bro code style and fight. Okay. Don't go for the, don't go for the balls. <laughs> don't go for the eyes. Like, 
don't mess the hair, you know? <laughs> like, so, so I go to him, I go, I go, why would I do that? And then he's like, look, man, he goes, do you know me? And I'm like, no. He goes, do you know how well I'm trained? I go, no. Do you know if I got a weapon on me? No. Do you know if I'm on drugs? No. Do you know if I got five friends around the corner that's going to jump in and help me out if you don't take me out quick? I go, no, I have no idea. He's like, well, you better hit me in the groin and end this quick. And I was like, done. I'm hitting you in the groin. I totally get it. Right. Like, and, and that's prob like, end this threat. Right. Yep. Like, yeah, because I don't, I don't know those X factors. So that's why Krav is so good. Right. And like, that's why I got into it because like, literally I remember, um, I did spend some time living and working in the U S when I was 20, I graduated college and I had an opportunity to go work in the U S and I remember I, I worked down at a jail. I was told it was the treatment center. So it's funny. I kind of got tricked. <laughs> uh, some recruiters came up to my college cause they just couldn't find locals to take jobs at this terrible jail in Boston. I'm not even going to say what it is, but it was crap hole jail in a terrible neighborhood. No American would work there. Why, why would they, they can work anywhere. So they figured we'll get some educated Canadians. They got the visa. They can only work for us. So we have them. That was very smart of them to do. So they came up. I had no real work experience, just graduated at 20 years old. And they said, oh, it's for helping kids. It's a treatment center. I'm like, oh, this is, this is great. I'll go to Boston. I'll help the kids and build some work experience. You know, so I loaded up my car with an air mattress and just the clothing I had and, and wave goodbye to my parents at the border at Buffalo and I headed down and I just drove the whole way down, get down there. And my first down the job, I pull up to the building and I'm like, this, this is, this is a weird looking place. Uh, this is all barred up. <laughs> and then I go in there and I'm like, this is not a treatment. This is a jail. And back then, uh, I don't know if things have changed. So if any of your American listeners say I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong. I but this is how it was back then in the state of Massachusetts, uh, if let's say you killed someone at in your 15, uh, you know, you killed them, you're going to do your sentence and you get sentenced, let's say 10 years. You'll do the first part of it in the youth treatment center. But when you're 21, that's when you go to the adult. So they, they send you to adult if you overlap sentence with that time. Right. Yep. So I had I had dudes in that jail. I was 20. And I had dudes in that jail that were older than me at 21. And they were way bigger than me. Like. It, you know, I, I'm talking, this is me at 20, not a professional martial artist, just still taking martial arts. It was mostly kickboxing back then, uh, before I got into the Krav or Muay Thai. It, and I remember the first jail fight that happened, I could hear the commotion going on. And I was like, what is happening down there? And I run to the day room and it's just full on brawl, Man. weapons and everything, everything. And I didn't freeze but I jumped in there. I started throwing like kicks at people like anybody had to. <laughs> and, and we eventually restrained everybody And because that's what I knew. I knew I was very good at kickboxing through my teenage years is what I did, right? I did kids karate as a kid, got into kickboxing as a teen. So I'm 20 now and like I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to hit these people and kick them, right? And just get them under control. And they don't even feel striking. When, you, when you're in a fight, like, you know, so if you could hack a leg kick on you, you know you're hurt, but you don't care. Yeah, you don't yep. feel it, right? The adrenaline is a painkiller in itself. So I was like, man, I, you need something more effective than this. So I did my time there. I came back up to Canada, got my my roots back. Uh, you know, I, I put my time in that jail, you know, for lack of a better term, do my time, came back up, uh, back to my family up here. And then, uh, you know, over the years, you know, I, I kept my job experience working in that field. And when I was working as a corrections officer, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to get back into this now. You know, I got my life set and it's time to get back to training. And, uh, so I, I Googled street fighting, martial art and Krav came up and that's when I went to Steve's school the next day. Like I literally have never looked back. It was just one day I took the class and now that's been my life ever since. So 15 years as a correctional officer, right? Yeah. Yeah. 15 years in there. Yep. So that, that probably includes a, a portion of that story you just mentioned, mentioned about Boston. Yeah, yeah. I started at Boston. And then the thing is, like, you know, once you get some work experience, it kind of snowballs. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like I grew up and said, you know, I would love to work in jail. That that sounds fantastic. Right. <laughs> like, you know, and and I don't even really talk about it too much now, because like if I'm at it, let's say I'm at a party and like people start talking, I go, oh, I used to work in a jail. Tell me all about it. Does this happen? Does this happen? Does this happen? And I'm like, Man, I worked in Supermax. So whatever's in your brain, that's what I tell people. Whatever's in your brain of what you think happened, yeah, I've, I've seen it. It's happened. And 
most of my time was spent at Toronto West Detention Center. Uh, I, I really enjoyed working there. But, but hold on it, a second. It was, you, you worked yeah. at Supermax? Yeah, yeah. Like, as bad I mean, as that, you that's get. That's as bad that's, as you get, yeah. Yeah, as bad as you get, right? Um, because once I put my time at other jails, I you know, you start to realize jail is jail. And, like, you know, it, it, like, yeah, Supermax jails, where, where I was... You know, the unfortunate thing, I worked at the detention center, so maximum security, but you could have some guy that comes in for a drunk driving charge, and then he's on the same unit as some gangbanger murderer. And I'm like, man, well, this guy's going to be like a lamb to the slaughter, man. Exactly. Like, I feel bad for this dude. You know, and like I said, you got to be careful. If people are listening to this. Like, I'm telling you right now, listeners, like, live your life as good as you can, but I've seen so many people... Where like just one bad night out and now they're in a bad spot, right? So mm -hmm. it actually stays with you forever because like the way I conduct my life too, there's sometimes where I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna avoid that situation because I don't wanna be on the other side of the bars now, right? But yeah, I, I did fifteen years doing that and I actually enjoyed it. I got because I didn't know any better. Like uh, at 20 years old, that's when I worked in Boston. So my whole adult working career up to that point was waking up putting on the uniform, going to jail, doing the job. Like it would, it was, and it was always you and a partner on a unit with up to 60 people. I was just going to ask that, so, like, like what was the, what were the yeah. numbers? So, so you're saying like well, the it, was, way, it was one to 30, two to 60. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way it would work is let's say, uh, <clears throat> where I was, let's say me and you are shift partners and I'm the inside guy for the day and you're the control module guy. So there's a little bubble, like what you see on the movies and on the left side is one housing unit that holds 30. And on the other side of you, it's another glass, and that holds 30, up to 30. So 60 total with up to three three guys in a cell. Two bunks, one floor. That's how we were just cramming people in. Because, again, this is Canada's biggest city. This is, this is like Canada's New York, right? So it, it's just jammed in there. And, uh, you know, for the most part, I, I give the guys credit. They, they would most of the days could be quiet, and then – you'd go on a stretch where it would just be a shit show for uh, like a week on end because there's some gel beef that's been brewing and then it just explodes and you have a fight on one unit. And sometimes guys would have friends on one unit and they're like, Hey man, I'm going to do this guy in at four o'clock. So start a code, start a fight on your unit yep. at three fifty-five, And that's going to get all the officers running to that unit. And then we're just going to take this guy in the bathroom because they would try to deplete our manpower yep. from unit to unit. Right. Cause disperse the power gives them more opportunity to, to do what they want right so uh i did that um i also the last couple of years uh i worked in the admissions and discharge for a number of years and um <clears throat> to give listeners a, a little background on, on that admissions and discharge is the worst part of the jail that's when uh, guys first come in off the street they're pissed off uh you know maybe you got arrested and then you look over in the holding cell and there's a guy you got a street beef with, and oh, mm -hmm. now's your chance to squash it. And we don't know. Yeah. So it's like, all right, you're we process you. Okay, Bill, you're going in this cell now. I crack it, and as soon as you go in, boom, big fight, right? Like, there's always stuff happening in there. Uh, it, you know, so that's an area where typically they would try to assign you for two years, kind of like when you're like a homicide detective, and the cops go, okay, you know, you're you're on beat, you're on cover for, you're going to be undercover for like two years max, and then you're out. Like that's it. Uh, I was supposed to be out in a couple of years. I ended up being in there for five years. Wow. And the, the reason I stayed on that unit for five years is because I had such a good team. We were such a good group. We looked out for each other. We took care of each other. And, uh, you know, it was working for me at that time in my life. And I spent the last couple of years, my last years were spent on the special needs unit. So guys like we're talking about earlier, like that would get arrested living on the streets, they got mental illness. Yeah. And that, I, I, I enjoyed that too. That was kind of fun. Like, I have a good sense of humor. Like, I don't let things get to me. Uh, so if, if I'm working a unit and the guy's going crazy and he's like, it, like, I don't know how much I can say on here, but like, if a dude's pissing and smearing crap all over his cell, I'm like, well, that's gross. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have to get that um, taken care of. And I'm like, I would just be like, dude, why are you doing that? And then the guy would look at me and start telling me why. And there's a demon in his cell and he's cleansing and doing a ritual. I'm like, very good. But, you know, bud, you're going to have to clean that up, dude. Like, <laughs> I, I wasn't the type to be like, hey, we're going to rush him and we're going to kick his ass. It's like, this guy's got problems. We got to get the psych ward up here. And, it, you know, I, I did that, too. Yeah, you can, by the way, you can say whatever you want. My show's open yeah, I to... Figured. 
I mean, you've heard some episodes, I, I, so you hear you hear the way yeah, I talk. Um, for sure. Um, but you know, take me back. I've never been in jail, so take me back there real quick. Yeah. How does it work? I mean, sure. when when do they have to be locked in their cells at a certain time? They get to come out in the morning. How does how does the whole thing? So are they out amongst hey. each other all day long? Yeah, they pretty much are. When you, when you come, if you're working a unit, a normal unit, not a special needs unit, you're working a general population unit. Um, the officers show up at six fifteen in the morning. We do our muster at six thirty, and then you go down to the unit and you do a shift change with the night shift. So the night shift goes home. You and your buddy, like I said, you and your partner take over. Two of you. So this is the worst part of my day, to tell you the truth. This was the part of the day where if I was going to get any nerves. Cause I don't care if I know how to fight and I don't care if I know martial arts. If, if they want to kidnap me and take me hostage and there's a bunch of them and there's one of me, like I'm toast. I don't care who you are. Right. And the worst part of the day, the, the most nerve wracking part of the day, that, that housing unit that I explained that has 30 in the morning, I, I look at you, let's say you're working the, the module, you know, let's say I got the breakfast cart, right. With all the meals on the cart. I look at you, okay, you open the sally port, I push the meal in one thing, that door shuts, next door opens, and I go in, all the doors crack, and so all the inmates start coming out, and I'm oh. not a morning person all at all. At once. Imagine if, what's that? Yeah, yeah, and imagine if you're not a morning person, all, and you got shit going on in your life, and you're in jail, and you're stressing out for your court case, or yeah. you got a beef with this guy yesterday, and like, maybe on lockup the night before, I was like, yeah, you know what, fuck you, Bill, tomorrow morning, you're going down, yeah, well, fuck you, okay, but, Let's wait till tomorrow. Let's do it, right? Yep. I don't know what I'm getting into. So all the doors unlock, and I just lock from one door. Then I go in, and your partner hits the lock module. So then you hear, doo, 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 doo. so all the locks start coming in, and all you got to do is press the cell door into the lock. So you get what you need for the day. Okay, Bill, get your shaving supplies, get your towels, get your clothing changed, whatever you need for the day because I'm locking up the cell, right? So you lock up all the cells. And by the time I get to the last cell, I'm on the very end of the unit with 30 inmates between me and the door. Mm. So that if they wanted to, that's the time where if they wanted to kidnap you and they wanted to take you, I mean, that like that's the time. Right. And, it, now, you know, I mean, you got to be smart. And you may not yep. be able to answer this, but you mentioned it. So have you seen that happen? What what triggered you to think that could be a possibility that they would want to well, kidnap? Well, because yeah, over, over over the years, people have gotten kidnapped, right? Like you know, the the best way to get what you want, get attention, is maybe to kidnap an officer or even hold an inmate, another inmate hostage, and and that's how things get out of control, right? right. So, it, you know, it, and actually, uh, <laughs> I I always thought the best thing I could do, it, because me and the officers would be like, man, what would you do if you're in that situation? Because like we know officers that would get taken hostage and. And like it messes them up. Like they quit, they never come back. A lot, right. a lot of them would never come back from that. Because why would you, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I would. Uh, like there's other jobs. That's the thing. And like I, my mindset really didn't change until I started running my school. I'm like, man, I can't believe I was in there for so long. Right. Like I'm, I'm so much better off now. But I used to always think, like, man, if they were gonna, if I felt a weird vibe and like I saw them rushing to get me when I was at that last, or I'd lock myself in the cell. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And then the worst thing, the worst thing they can do is maybe try to set it on fire from the outside. And I would just keep setting it and putting it out with toilet water. <laughs> right. They can't do too much if I lock myself in there, right? And then yeah, I would just yeah, wait for the smart. riot team, you know. And then you wait for the riot team to come, and then they can handle it. And then let me get out. Let me go home. And uh, I quit. Give me a payout. Like, <laughs> give me a traumatized payout. Uh, you know, because that, that's the one. Thing. At least it was a government job, right? So I put my time in. I paid into my pension, and uh, I do have a pension. Now, so when I'm 56, I'll be able to collect. So the the government of Ontario, they did take care of us. They do take care of you when you leave, and uh, they, that was my service time, right? So I was never looking to leave, though. And I just want to make something clear: um, it's not all about what people think. It's not like you're going in there and it's like, all right, it's the guards against the inmates. Yeah, like what you see on movies. And right. I hate how they always make the seals look like assholes in the movies. Yeah, it's not true. Like I, there was a number of, of inmates that I knew for years and i had no issue with them like you, you know no issue and, and sometimes stuff would happen where maybe one inmate didn't know me and he's giving me a hard time and the other inmates would go up to that troublemaker and be like hey man not him he's cool like don't yep. bug that guy he's he's one of the good guys right and, yep. you know just like just like any other job there were some co's that were assholes and i'd call them out and i'm like dude you're not helping anything man you're you're pissing them off. And you know what? That's not the inmates fault. That's your fault. You're being a dick today. Yeah. Right. Like, 
there, it, it actually is like a, it's like a little town. It's a city within a building with its own set of rules and its own set. Like you can't go to the jail and like, you're not supposed to whistle. Like if you walk down the, you're like, Oh yeah, that, that's not the, you can't do that, but you don't know if nobody tells you. Exactly. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of jail rules, but I, I liked using my brain at that job. And I think it helps me when I teach self-defense to this day. I know it makes a big difference for me as a martial arts teacher because I, I've lived through a lot of stuff. So when I tell people, you know, de-escalation is the best way to go, sometimes you just got to let people, like, vent themselves, and then they can cool down. Like, those are all lessons that really helped me get by for that long in there. And, and I was never looking to leave that job. People think that I started the school because I couldn't handle the jail. It was time to get out, and that was my exit. That was not my exit strategy at all. Not at all. Um you know, you talked about, I, I know a big part of your podcast, the reason I like it, you cover self-help, entrepreneurship, just ways to improve yourself and what can happen in life. And very, very, very cool story that still I love telling, and it's 100% true. So you never know where things take you. I realized after I got my black belt in Krav, you know, I'm like, okay, I, I got my black belt from a city called Hamilton. Hamilton is 45 minutes away from Toronto. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Hamilton. Okay. So after Steve, I went to his school, which was in Oakville. Steve closed his school. I was halfway through the program. I, I was a brown belt at the time. So I'm like, man, I, 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 and I knew Steve's friend Ed had a school in Hamilton. So I'm like, you know what? They're probably teaching the same Krav. I'll just go to Hamilton to finish the program. And then I can visit my parents when nights I train, visit my friends Hamilton's fine with me. I'll make the commute. So I was commuting from Toronto to Hamilton for my Krav lessons. When I got my black belt, I told Dad, I go, hey, man, like, you know, I love doing this. How about I volunteer on Fridays? You don't have a class on Friday night. I'll do it for free. I'll just give back to my school. I'm 30 years old. I'm not a teenage kid. I'm 30 years old, and I'm giving up my time to drive. Actually, I wasn't 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was. I was driving to, uh, to Ed's school. I would teach for free on Friday. And then I even cleaned the toilets in the bathrooms after closing. I'd clean for him yeah. just because I appreciated what he would do. And then I, when I first started the class, I started with like five people. Ed's like, okay, we got a new Friday. Uh, so I started with like five people. And then like they liked it. And then next week I have 10. The week after that I got 15. And then I noticed after about six months of doing the volunteer Fridays, I'm like, man, I got a packed house. Like I'm, I must be good because – they can go to Ed's all week, but some of them are still choosing to come to mine on Friday as part of their training routine. So I must be good at this. And I knew that there was not any, with all due respect, I mean, like there was the scene for Krav in Toronto was not good at that time years ago. Now there's more schools opened up here in Toronto. I don't, I don't pay attention to my competition schools. I don't care. I focus on me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the other schools are doing. I know what I'm doing, but I do know there's more options now for Krav in Toronto. So, but at the time there was not, and it used to bug me because there was only one school and I was like, wait a minute. Like, I think that I'm just as good as the way that school is running and how they're teaching, but that dude's making a full-time living and I'm going to jail every day. Yeah. And I'm like, I think I can have a school. So when I was working in the jail, and this is honest to God, a true story. I have never owned a business in my life. I have not taken one business course. I did take recreation and community services in college, which is basically how to run community centers, set up minor league sports teams, that sort of thing, right? Get a grant for a sport program. These things I knew, but my, I kind of, my education kind of sat on the dust because I graduated that when I was 20, started the job in Boston, then it was jail, jail, jail. But I still had the education to actually run that type of business. And I grew up in the, in the martial arts. So I was kind of like a gym rat. I knew the business, right? So I started making notes on my iPhone, like the notepad you got on your phone where you can make notes, right? Yep. So as long as, there, as long as there was no fights going on, if it was a quiet day, jail is jail. And sometimes you got a lot of downtime. So I, I'd be making, and not like they can fire me now for hearing this, I'm already gone. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, like if there's no fights, nothing going on, I'm back in the, the computer module with you and we're both just sitting there with our feet up looking at the, the cameras, hoping that there's no fights and everything looks cool. We're good, right? Because like I told you, it's not like the movies. You can go two weeks where nothing happens. And it's just dudes playing cards at the table watching Jerry Springer during the day. Yep. Uh, so I'm sitting there. 
and I'm making notes on my phone and I'm Googling like martial arts management and I'm looking at the price of rent of like open space in Toronto. And I, I would go home and I would transfer from my phone uh, onto my computer to make an actual business plan with what I was researching during the day. And after about six months, I completed my first business plan for the school. And I, I, I called up Ed and I go, hey, you know, the guy from Hamilton that I finished my got my black belt with. I go, I got something I want to run by. You. I go, we, we should meet for lunch, right? And I slid him my business plan. He starts flipping through it. And Ed's a very, you know, quiet to the guy point, very stern, very, you don't know what he's thinking when you look at him, right? You don't know if, he, if he's into it or he's not. He's like a poker face when he's flipping the pages. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, he's like, you're serious. I go, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind start, starting my own program. He's like, you know, yeah, he, he's like, and then he told me the ins and outs of it, the pros and the cons. And he's like, yeah, I think you could do it. You know, why don't you start part time and, and see where you can rent. Right. So I took my business plan and I literally, literally like, like so old school made some phone calls to local gyms, fitness centers, because every fitness center has a studio. And I knew that. Most have like their yoga studio, their spin classes. There's always an open space in most gyms. Yep. And I thought this would be a much more cost effective way if I can talk some gym into let me rent some space. That's way better than going up to a landlord and going, hey, I want to rent this for like thousands a month when I have no students and I don't know what I'm doing. So I took my business plan to a few gyms, sat down with the, the managers of a few gyms. One gym took me on. They go, this is awesome. They showed me the studio. They go, we've got nothing in here past 7 o'clock. I go, okay, you know, I'll, I'll pay for – I have no students. It would be new. So how about I rent it Mondays and Wednesday nights, and we agreed on X amount of dollars per month. So I started working overtime in the jail to afford that studio renting, and it cost me about $30,000 for the equipment and things I needed to kind of retro the studio because it wasn't made for martial arts. So there was some poles – metal poles where I'm like, man, if someone gets knocked into that pole, it'll be like final destination. <laughs> like the head's going to explode. This, this is not good for martial arts. I got I got to retro this place. So $30,000. And at that point, uh, just to paint a picture of, you know, just sometimes you just got to do things at this point. Um, I'm 33. Cause I said, we're, we're on the 10 year anniversary. I'm 33. My ex-wife's pregnant with my kid and I'm looking at the studio and I'm like, this was either a really good idea or a really bad idea. I don't know which one yet, but I did figure even if I bomb, the most I wasted was the price of a car, mm -hmm. right? And I'll just pay for it, but at least I tried, right? At least I tried. This was kind of cool that I tried, right? And then I started with like just a few people from the gym because you're in a gym, so that helps you get your first couple of students and then after that, I'm like, okay, now I got a few people. Now I can afford to advertise a little bit. So I'm going to spend a couple hundred on advertising. Now I got more. Okay, now I need to buy another night because now these two nights aren't enough. And then I, I didn't spend any money. I just, okay, now I can pay off. I'm going to pay off that 30 grand soon, right? So then I, I'm like, holy shit, you know, I've paid off the 30 grand and now I'm three nights a week. And then I got the jail to adjust my schedule where I go, look, my, my, my school's picking up. So I told the schedule manager, I go, can you put me in at nighttime? So what I started doing was I would teach from seven to 10. I would take a shower at 10 o'clock, put on my jail uniform, get up to the jail for 11 PM. And I'd work all night from 11 to seven. And then I'd sleep all day. I'd wake up and I'd do it again. Wow. And so I, I did that for about a year. And then I had an incident where I was working the special needs unit where I was uh, serving the meals. And there was one dude that uh, he he had a history of throwing piss and shit at the COs, right? So they're like, man, when you feed him his meal, you got to open the hatch, like the hatch you see on the movies where they put the meals in, right? Yeah. They go, you got to open the hatch and, uh, you, you know, tell him to go to the back, the back of the cell so he can't rush you. And if he does, close the hatch quick, right? So you always make him go to the hatch and then you drop a bagged lunch on the floor with like a juice bag and a sandwich and a muffin, a snack, right? So, uh and even though I did the job for so long, there's still the humane part of you that doesn't like doing that. You're still a human. I don't want to drop your meal on the floor. Right. Right. Like it, it does get to you sometimes, no matter how long you've been doing it, no matter how long crusty you are, grizzled vet you are, I still had a heart. Right. So 
this guy was really cool with me for about two days. I worked that unit and I'm like, man, this guy's being all right. And he doesn't seem to have a problem with me. And so I was handing out the tea and the coffee and believe like they, they have tea or coffee it was just crazy if that's boiling water it, to me that's always a weapon yeah exactly so but but it's dietary they were allowed to have it so um you know he showed me the cup through the window like hey can i have a cup and this guy hadn't had tea after dinner for so long right so i was like okay you know what uh, i'll pour this guy a fucking tea he's been good right so you know not, maybe i think i'm getting through to him right yeah, so yeah. maybe I mean... we maybe maybe we got a repertoire right so um, I go, sure. He showed me the cup, but what I didn't know was the cup he showed me was full of piss and shit. Ugh. So I open up the hatch to pour him a cup and I thought he was going to hand me a cup to fill up with tea. Instead, he sticks the cup out and he goes, fuck you. And he throws it right in my face. Ugh. Right. And, and, and I, for a lack of better term, I got the, I ate shit. I got the, the piss oh, God, and damn. shit in my mouth. I closed the hatch and I don't know how AIDS work, but in my head, I'm like, I got AIDS for sure. I know it. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. You're thinking like, the worst. You, you, yeah, you're thinking the worst, right? So I, I, I go to the Iowa station. I flush everything out. I call the captain. I go, get somebody down here. I'm going to the hospital right now. I got to take the drug cocktail, right, where they give you all the medications to kill anything right away when things get in. And, and then, you know, work told me to take some time off. They go, yeah, that, that's, that sucks that that happened. Take some time off. I go, okay, yeah, fuck that. You know, I took time off. Then they called me to come back. And I go, you know, I, I need more time off. I'm not coming back. In fact, I'm putting in uh, for, uh, like, I, I, they go, when are you coming back? I go, I don't know. And then I got a thing in the mail. I go, I'll take an unpaid leave for a while. And then I got a thing in the mail where m my work ordered me to go get assessed, right? So now my work is covering their ass. They sent me to get psychological evaluation. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, sure, I'll do that. I'm, I'm not crazy, but I'm a little pissed off. I'll go do that. So uh, on their orders, I went to a psych hospital in Toronto, and I got interviewed by a doctor. And you ever see Shawshank Redemption oh, where yeah. they give the stamp on Morgan Freeman, like denied, <laughs> yeah. right? So I, I got the crazy stamp because they asked me questions where they go, how long have you been there? I go, years. And they go, well, and you haven't been back? I go, no. I go, that was a crappy incident. I want a little time off away from that environment. I go, so I'm just chilling out right now. They go, do you think if you went to the jail, you'd get in a fight tomorrow? I go, well, that's a stupid question. I go, it's a jail. I go, I don't, I don't know when I'll get in a fight, but yeah, I'm going to get in a fight again for sure. Yep. And they asked me a bunch of dumb questions and I answered them all honestly. And then they, they go, no, this guy needs uh, he's been in there too long. He needs to get some therapy. So I got, uh, it was a blessing in disguise, that incident, because they actually gave me paid time off and I wasn't double dipping because my school wasn't in the profit. I wasn't paying myself. So I wasn't double dipping at like, you know, having the treatment, and getting paid time off and then having my own business. The business was, wasn't getting paid. And for six months, I had six months of paid treatment, which was very nice of them to give me. And uh, it, honestly, it really didn't do too much for me. It wasn't like I was like, hey, I feel like a new man and my issues are sorted out. I, it was just nice to kind of process that many years in jail and kind of go over the stuff that happens to you that you kind of push out, out to the bottom, right? And yeah. at the end of six months, it was time to go back to the jail, pick up that job. But at six months, six months more down the road, now my school can cut me a small paycheck. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to take unpaid leave even longer. And it was actually the the doctors that were like, no, man, if your school is working, like maybe you should just do a career change. Maybe you're done. Yeah. And I go, yeah, you know, may maybe I am done. And then I, I informed the jail shortly after that. I go, yeah, I'm going to formally resign. So I'll see you there to hand in my badge, my uniform, sign the papers. And I remember when I, I, I signed the paper, the human resource woman that I'd been with for years and years, she's like, you know, when you sign that, like, that's it. And I go, yeah, that's it. She goes like, you're, you're, you're resigning. You don't get your pension till 56. That's your retirement year. Like, that's it. And I go, yeah, give me the pen. I signed it. And I remember a few of my friends walked me out the jail door and the sun hit my face. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I, I'm done. I, I'm that's it. I'm I'm not a CEO anymore. I'm a civilian now. I'm I'm not an officer anymore. Did I'm it, just a regular guy. Did it feel good or were you were you questioning your decision? No, I wasn't questioning the decision. It, it was it felt good. And the school gave me a modest living like, you know, I, I made a lot of money at the jail and I don't make nowhere near that much money now teaching martial arts. But, you know, when you have your own business, it's the freedom that that pays for things in other ways money can't. Yeah. Plus, you're doing right? what you love to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're so not going to get pissed right? and shit thrown in your face right now. 
Hey, when unless you- a student is <laughs> unless a student's very mad at their monthly billing, then <laughs> <laughs> hey, when yeah, you went when you so went far, back no. to the jail, was that guy still there? Um, I would have no idea because this was many months after and people come and go. Right. And I think that guy was on a uh, deportation. I think we were just kind of we also had immigration holding. So I think he was illegally in the country, too. So he, he was probably got kicked out. All right. So in your mind, so, yeah. you were you were able to get past who did that to you. Right. You weren't going oh, yeah, back to yeah. the jail I, thinking, oh, no, this guy's fuck. still there. No. You know? Now, even if he was still there, I don't have no vendetta. The guy's mentally ill. I don't care. Right. Yeah. You know, I didn't take anything personal at all in those jails. Right. It's just that was the environment. It, I never took anything personal. And that's why it never really got to me. You know, and to tell you the truth, the funny thing is that I don't even think about it anymore. Like it, it feels like it doesn't even happen. Like when I, when I get together with some of my CEO friends and I still see them and like, they tell me what's going on in the jail. And then we start telling stories from back in the day. I'm like, man, I totally forgot that happened. Like that part of me is it happened, but it's almost like your brain pushes those memories of the terrible things you saw it pushes it away i don't even think about it anymore yeah which is good because we, we want to try to remember our best memories right not the not the horrible yeah, ones we're yeah, all going to have I, sad I, ones that will come and you know hit us every once in a while but we want to try to remember the, the positive stuff is what's going to help us continue to grow yeah i can say wholeheartedly i i have zero ptsd i mean the only thing that i do is i'm just aware of my surroundings like I paid like just like what you're saying, right? I, I kind of do the same thing, but that's not really jail related. That's just common sense from training and being involved in martial arts and everything through the years, right? So, all right, so you entered yeah. into entrepreneurship, right? So you you've mm-hmm. entered into it. Some people have this misconception, and I've talked about this, and I've done episodes about it, right? That they think it's just all fun and glory, and now I can take as much time off as I want. I own the business. I can do whatever. Um, but that's not really how entrepreneurship works. No, it's not. You get out of it what you put into it. So if you're if you're somebody who is going to maybe hire somebody and try to get them to run your business, and I mean, I, there's people who do that, right? And but that's that's kind of on a bigger scale. But if you're not mm-hmm. willing, if you're not if you're not showing up every day and putting in the time and the work, your your opportunities for success become much slimmer. Yes. And as you were saying, uh, like what you put in is what you get out. Right. So, you know, I've gotten to the point with elite where I have such good staff. We've been open so long and I've made friends in the business from other schools that are high level instructors that go, oh, you know, I've had people like high level people approach me and say, hey, could I work at your school? And I'm like, I am not going to say no to an instructor your level and you just work out what's a respectable rate of pay that works for them, what works for you. And so I, I'm at a point now where, I mean, like I, I like working in teaching Monday to Wednesdays and then the second half of the week I, I have my staff in there to help me out. And there's always two of us working all the time. So the students get like proper ratio of instructor to students. That's, that's very important. I think, uh, what you give people, um, you, you know, don't cut corners, right? When we got busy, I'm like, we need two of us working all the time. But I have enough quality staff where I could be that guy that sits back and just makes the schedule and just runs it and shows up once in a while. But I love teaching and training, so I always make sure I'm there for the Mondays to Wednesdays. If I got a chance to see my daughter on Wednesday nights, something comes up, you know, my staff knows she's number one. I'm I'm always going to take my chance to see her, right? If my ex is like, hey, I need you for this night, I'm like, yep, yep, I'll take her right away. And that's that's the trade-off with entrepreneurship. But, you know, even earlier before we got on the podcast here, you asked me if it's okay because, you know, my daughter's in the other room right now. My daughter is already at eight years old. She knows that I got to get my work done before I can have fun with you. I just got to get it done, and then we have all day. Like right. when we go on vacation – I don't have a manager anymore and I don't have an admin staff. I used to, but I don't now. Um, that was all part of like, a, like we'll talk later, but during COVID we got annihilated. So I started doing all the, all the uh, admin work myself again. And then now I just got so used to doing it. I'm like, you know what? It, it runs a lot easier when I do the admin because no one's going to care about the business as much as me. So it's better for me to do it than hire somebody else and then be like, Hey, did you email those people? Did you get back to that person? Did you book that? Did you do that? No, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll just do it. Right. Right. So it, let's say I take my daughter on vacation. I bring my laptop with me. I wake up, fire up the coffee. She can watch a little YouTube chill, like, you know, do a little chill and have her breakfast. And she knows I got to fire up the computer 
and I'll answer all the emails, book all the intro classes, follow up with everybody that just did a class the previous night. If some people want to sign up, we can do that now electronically. Like if you take a class, let's say Bill takes a class on Monday night, right? On Tuesday morning, I'm emailing you with your, your training options. If you go, yeah, Dan, it was awesome. I had a great time at, at Harold's class, you know, sign me up for six months. I can send you the enrollment virtually. You can sign that, send it back to me, and then you're booked in. So I can still run the place no matter where I am, but I always got to make sure I get that done and then I can have fun. And that's already been instilled in my daughter. She knows like if she's got homework, you know, we're doing your homework now and then we can have movie time later, but we got to get this done now. And I was going to say that to you because, and, and, with this comment I'm about to make and what I'm about to say is in no means am I bashing any Krav schools, okay, or anyone out there yeah. teaching Krav. But you were you were pretty instrumental with helping me getting my school really off the ground. You know, you weren't my instructor, you weren't my teacher, and you really did that for me, Dan, just out of the kindness of your own heart. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah, I did. I I I I saw that you were going for it and I, I thought you were a great person when we started corresponding just like by messenger, by phone calls. And I was like, man, this guy's where I was just a few years back. I got some tricks of the trade that might be able to help him. You know, I'll give you what worked for me, and then you you can take what you want. You don't have to do everything I'm suggesting. Take what works for you and whatever you want to take, go for it. And whatever you're what you don't want is, is fine. And because I don't live where you live, I don't have the same demographics. So there's gonna be some differences. But yeah, it, that was just uh to help. Just I saw somebody that wanted to go for it, and I was like, All right, here you go. Here's what I got for you. And that's what I want everybody to to listen to, right? You meet you and I had no connection. I did not no, train none. with you. I didn't. You were not my instructor. You were not who certified me in Krav Maga. You just saw an opportunity to help someone. And that's right. Yeah, and you did. And you know, I think we need to get back to more of that in the in society today. I, there's so much anger and hatred towards every little thing. But you know, you look at what you did. You didn't know me from Adam, right? You had, you had no idea who I was, but you saw somebody that you you saw some potential in and you yeah i i had i had done that seminar in colorado when you were thinking about going and then that's how you kind of followed up with me like oh how'd it go and i wanted to go i couldn't make it and i was like hey man no problem and then that's how we started talking right and then then we started exchanging ideas and you were letting me know the direction you were going and i'm like okay cool you know here's what i have and because i have students that i've taught and they've gone on to have their own schools and, you know, I don't I don't ask for a cut of their income. I don't ask for an annual uh, affiliation fee. I don't do that. All I do is, you know what, all you need to do is just when I do an instructor course, it, if you're going to put your name to my name, you just got to at least take the instructor course and let me teach you how to teach and give you the systems. And then you're on your own. Right. right. I don't need no right. affiliation fee. I don't want a part of your income. I don't want a percentage. Just take the courses so I can see that you're good. So, like, you know, I know that your training's on par and I can help you with the actual teaching and training. And and you, you know what? It, it's funny we're talking about this because here's another backwards way coming from a guy who's 63 now, been teaching martial arts forever. But uh, John Suchart, when he, he vents to me and he, he gets frustrated because he's been in the business so long and he's so old school, he's like, hey, man, he's like, what gets me super mad? He goes, crew, these, these school owners – they don't understand. Like they, they think about the business. They can't pay the rent. They're stressed about this, stressed about that. They call me. They get mad. They can't make a living. They're working two jobs. He's like, how come this doesn't happen for you? He goes, how come your school's working? He goes, because what, what you do is you kind of go backwards. If I focus on my own training and I focus on my own teaching and I put my energy into the class, like, you know, no matter what's going on in my life, I can have shit going on in my life. I can have a terrible day. And I say this when I do staff training, when I talk to my, my staff about teaching, when I'm at that school, I have to give everybody my best. And when I turn the tunes on and the skipping ropes are going and the sweat gets going and the vibes are going, I forget about the day that I had. And I'm just in that for the next two, three hours. And if I do a good class, then people will sign up. They'll tell their friends, positive Google reviews. People start sharing stuff on social media. And just by doing a good job and giving them everything I can, then the business takes care of itself. Then you're paying the rent. Then you're able to cover your bills because you're focused on the teaching. You're focused on what you're giving the students. You're not focused on 
the business failing or, or that end of it. And, and I know it sounds backwards and slightly cheesy, but it's true in that field. I agree with you a hundred percent. I, I've, I've, I've built some amazing things. I'm operating and owning a company right now. We have the largest online automotive store for Hyundai parts. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what I do. So I've, I've created that business. I have employees, but here's how I look at it. I'm 50 and I have done some amazing things in my life. And I'll, I'll explain to you why I closed my crop school here in a second. But I look at it as ethical capitalism. I've done mm-hmm. what everything I need to do. Right. I've made a great living for myself, for my family. My wife works hard. We we don't really want for anything. Ethical mm-hmm. capitalism to me is now it's my responsibility as a business owner to give that back and teach that to every single person who works for me. It's yeah. not about me anymore. I show up not for me. I show up for them. Yeah, I, I could sit back and not not. And that's what I was saying. Right. So you get out of it what you put into it. I I show up every day for them. I don't have to go. I can and, leave, and I can leave it, what it, I wanted. I could do what I want, but I show up. And by by doing that, by doing that, they feel like they're part of your team. They're more motivated to give you their best. And by giving you their best, then your company stays where you want it to be because it's not deteriorating. Just through that give and take, that mutual give and take, and that respect, and that helping each other, I can, that's how you keep the system going. I can 100% tell you that since I took that company over a year and a half ago, we have grown over 200%. That's beautiful. Employees have gone from, from what they were making to double. Yeah. So they understand what's happening. And, and every well, single person I have that works for me, they would walk through a wall for me. I was just going to say that they're aware of that increase and that's going to make them work. But they're appreciating that because a lot of people in your shoes would keep that profit to themselves. Look at how much better I'm doing. So there you go. It's like, it, you, you know, that that does create quality people, quality products and a quality business. Like when we reopened, you know, I, I was screwed. I was just d- destroyed. And I had good people that came back to help. And I'm like, look, man, I'm like. I can only pay you X amount of bucks. Like everybody's taking a pay cut now. I'm sorry. I go, but let's give it some time, rebuild this thing and and I'll get things back where it was. And sure enough, just like you, like I started giving those increases and, and you know, I do the same thing with my staff. Like, you know, you've been teaching X amount of hours. You're going up five bucks a class. Like, you know, you, you keep those little raises coming. Right. And just to show appreciation if people, if people feel appreciated, regardless of the raises, five bucks or a double in the pay, People feel appreciated. They're going to work harder and they're going to stay longer. They do. And a thank you, you know, goes a long way, right? Yeah, Recognition, does. a pat on the back, recognizing something that somebody did that really wasn't their responsibility, right? Like I walk around and pick up little pieces of paper on the floor. People, you know, maybe the average person would think I'm crazy, but I've instilled mm-hmm. that into all of my staff. Yeah. If you, if you see a piece of paper on the floor, no matter what position you're in in that business, pick it up. Don't just yeah, leave it well, there for the lowest level or the janitor to come and sweep it up. Pick it up. We, I, I, I own and run the place. I pick it up. I don't just leave it there for somebody else to pick it up. But I wanted to talk to you real, real briefly here, real quick. Sure. Your, your, the way that you operated your business proves to me because you made it through COVID. Now, I did not close my school because of COVID. A lot of people believe I did. Mm-hmm. But full transparency is I did not. Full yep. transparency on the reason I closed my school was because I felt I could not give it the effort that it deserved. That yeah, meant that yeah. if no, I was having fair. if I was having students come in and pay me and I wasn't putting in the effort for them that they deserved, there was no there's no reason for me to be in business. Plus, I really mm-hmm. I I do feel in a roundabout way, um, am I certified? Yeah, I guess you could say that on paper. Mm-hmm. But do I really know, like, like, I mean, Dan, you're, you're not that my school wasn't real, right? It, it existed. We trained a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, we taught sure. a lot of things. Absolutely. But for me to take my school, not, not business sense wise, but knowing Krav Maga, like, you know, Krav, Krav Maga compared to how I knew it, I, I felt I was doing everybody an injustice. And if I feel I'm doing that, then I need to make a change. And the change mm-hmm. is either either spend the time to learn and know the system better, which 
unfortunately right now I just did not have the time to do. So that's, I couldn't make that commitment to my students um, or close. And I, I decided to close. So it wasn't COVID that really shut me down. It was my own mindset, knowing that if I can't give a hundred percent to this and a hundred percent to the people who are paying me to come and learn this, then I need to be honest with them. And we, we needed to close. Well, and that's always something that you can go back to, right? As life goes on, there may be an opportunity in the future, right? So uh, I know we've always talked about, you know, come on up to Toronto. We'll do some training again one day and stuff like all those doors are still open. Right? I am. Life, I'm definitely going to come to Toronto. We are, yeah. we are going to do some training. Yeah, that is definitely going to yeah, happen. So- I'm going to come for a, Blue Jays game, maybe maybe a, a hockey Leafs game. Lose. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but the, but I wanted to ask you, you you mm-hmm. had to build right. Everything works off the foundation that we build. If we don't have a strong and solid foundation, doesn't matter what we we put on top of that. It's gonna it's gonna collapse. You you had to have had a very strong foundation to make it through the COVID times. Me and you talked about the COVID times and what was happening in Canada. It was very similar to what happened in the States. So explain to everyone how you were able to make it through that. Oh, well. First, Uh, (laughs) first, let them understand that your school, your school has how many students? Uh, Right now, today, we have about 330 on the books, about 30 frozen and a number. So we got about 330 on the stat on the master list, about. 290 actively paying. So yeah, we, we, we've been hovering between those that's numbers. A, that's a, those are very strong numbers. Yes, they are very strong numbers that took a lot of work to get to and, and a lot of quality training. And we have three programs, right? So we got Krav Maga, Motai and women's self-defense. Okay. So, but what impresses uh, we, me the we've most? We've grown to three. Do you know how many you had before COVID? Yeah, I do. I, I can tell you exactly what happened. We, we ended up, uh, I went through a bit of a whirlwind, um, and I don't mind talking about this. And and it, you know, the purpose of your podcast was self help and like what happens in life. Like, uh, you know, I went through everything. It wasn't just COVID in my business. Um, I life kicked my ass pretty good for a couple of years. I had um, the school was fine. I, I changed locations. I went from one location into a new gym. Uh, an opportunity came. Um, to go into a different place. So I went to a different location. So I kind of upgraded in 2019. And I was building a student base over at the new spot. And then it was um, at the same time I was going through that in 2019, I was actually starting to go through the separation process with my ex. And like me and her are cool. Uh, I still like she's still my family. She knows that anything she needs shoot me a text. I'm right there. We always love each other like family. And we, we have our daughter together and she'll never get caught in the middle of any childcare stuff. Nothing. That's never going to happen to my kid. Uh, we, we made those, those agreements very clear. So my daughter's a very happy, well-adjusted child, but it was hard to go through that sad process of losing that, that part of your life. Watch you feel like a failure when right. that happens. Yeah. So re- regardless of how you feel like, man, I'm a statistic, man. I'm going to be that 50%. This is, and like, I still love this person. Like, what the fuck? Like, what's going on? I'm, I'm very sad that this is happening. Uh, you know, but it, this is probably the right move to make. It just, it hurts right now to make this move. And I'm super sad. And, and you got that security of like double income. You know, if something happens to you, at least your, your partner still got, you have each other. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I'm going to go back, back out in the wild and, uh, like take care of myself again. And, And like when you're self-employed, you got good months and bad months. And before, like my ex had a government job, very well educated. She's a very good family. Like I think a lot of people that are jerks would have just stayed in the marriage just because my my ex had a very wealthy, well-off family. And like that's not my style, right? I want to do what's best for me and her. I'm not going to mooch off some family that I married into. That's not right. Yeah. So uh, this was before Cody was – COVID just kind of came and happened at the worst time because – we had sold our house, like the matrimonial house, we had sold it. And I'm looking for a new place to live with the budget I have. And I don't know if you know the housing situation in Toronto, but it's out of control, man. Like you can buy a box, like a one bedroom, nothing for like 750, 800,000 in downtown Toronto. I can't live in downtown Toronto anymore. Right. So it's similar you know, to I, what's I, going on in the States. Same thing. Yeah, I guess like all over. So I, um, you know, I ended up, things were getting finalized with that. And then 
my landlord from the gym, like in March of 2020, he's like, Hey man, this stupid COVID thing. Like, you know, I guess we got to close for two weeks and I'm like, okay, fine. I'll tell my students. And at this point we had 200, right around 200. Right. And so, you know, I just told the students, I go, Hey, you know, let us deal with this. We're closing for a bit. And, you know, and then I had found, I was running out of time. I had to find a place to live. I'd be looking at like 30 different condos and homes in the GTA, greater Toronto area, just looking for a place that was big enough for me and my daughter and um, I was like, okay, you know, I, I found a place where I am now, where I'm half an hour outside of downtown. Um, and I, so I found my place. Okay, I'll get it because I'm running out of time. I got to get out of my house. Like we closed our deal. Like I have to leave. I got to get a place. So I got lucky and I found a really good place that meets my needs. Beautiful home that me and my daughter live in now when I have her. And, and but then, uh, you know, then things kept dragging on. We're closed this month. Now we got to close again. And then. Nobody knew what was happening with this. And it's like, hey, you know, like uh, I billed my students for March and April, but we were closed. And I told them, I go, I'll give the money, like I'll give it back to you. When we, when we reopen, no one's going to get charged for a couple of months. Like, you know, let me give this back to you. Just give me a chance or you're not going to have a school to come back to. Just bear with me. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people had government jobs, office jobs. They could work from, I couldn't, right? And I go, if you want a place to come back to, you just got to be there for this, but I'll make it up to you. Right. And then it was, you know how I got through it was, I had a good landlord. He, um, he made a deal, the owner of the gym where I rent, I rent the gym studio in my office. The owner of that gym ended up getting some of the financial aid that the Canadian government was giving some businesses to help pay their rent. And so I didn't qualify cause I was too small and he qualified. So he was able to make a deal with his landlord and then he passed that along to me and, and my landlord's like, okay, he's like, don't charge your students anymore. He's like, you know, I'm not going to charge you rent and I got myself covered. So I'll pass that on to you. He could have just, you know, squeezed me and rang me out during his hard time sure. and just squeeze me till I'm gone. And then he doesn't have, and I told him, I go, what you're doing is not going to be forgotten and you're going to have my rent money for years to come. I'm going to make this up to you. Right. But during that time, um, I still lost so many people. I went from about 200 all the way down to like a skeleton group of like 80 people. Cause like every month I was getting, Hey, I don't feel comfortable. I don't know when I'm going to train. I quit. I quit. I quit every day. It just, I quit. I quit. I'd wake up, check my mail. I quit. I quit. And I was living off of, uh, the Canadian government had funding uh called serb i forget what it stands for but it was 900 bucks canadian every two weeks and that's what you could get and that was just kind of it, it sucked because my ex was working and then my daughter would come to my place and i'm like like yeah we got crappy food right now i'm sorry <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. you know I, I saved some money and i always like I would let her have a great meal and then I would eat cereal. <laughs> like I'd eat an avocado. Like I was living like that. And, and there were times where I would just sit there, like just, I'd get five quit emails in a day and I don't care to admit it. Like there were times I just sat there and what was happening? Like now I'm divorced. I'm living in a new place. I'm losing my business. I'm eating fruit for dinner while just so my kid can eat a steak. And like, I would sit there and I would just cry. I'm like, like it would just come out of me. And I'm, I'm like, I'm going to get past this because I have no choice. Like I have a kid I got to take care of. I'm going to get through it. I, it. Life might look different on the other end. Maybe I'm not going to have this school anymore. Maybe I'll have to work at the jail again. Maybe I'm going to have to do a security officer job. Maybe I'll have to work at the Amazon warehouse, but some way I'm going to put food on the table and I'm not going to lose my home and I'm going to be, I'm going to have to do something. Right. And then, and then over time, there was some more wiggle room where the government's like just stupidness because they don't run business. And what happened was I watched the U S at the start, it was a little crazy in the U S and then things started opening up state by state and each state was kind of doing their own thing. And I watched that from Canada and Canada started a little bit more relaxed and then they tightened up like a dictatorship. Yeah, you did. And, because um, I remember you reaching out to me because you were trying to get some info on what was and New York was one of the worst states. Right. So yeah. Yeah, it was. If you could start to see some relaxation in New York, it gave kind of the rest of the world a little bit of hope. But um, so I remember Canada, you reaching Canada out to got, me. But I'm yeah, it seemed yeah. like you guys lasted longer. No, because what happened was Canada got really, really power hungry. And, and that's the truth. Like, I think our politicians, they started getting used to having the control. And once 
by human nature, once you have the control, you don't want to give it up. And these doctors, the thing is, these doctors that no one ever heard of, they, they now became celeb- local celebrities in Toronto. So every day, oh, here comes this doctor's daily press conference. And she'd take the podium and, you know, today we have this many this and this that. And these businesses remain closed. You know, all restaurants, this they were making restaurants eat outside in Toronto, Canada in January and February and said dining's allowed but outside on the patio. Really in a blizzard? Yeah. With a heat lamp? Like they, come on. They were doing off, right? they were and, doing that in the city and you knew it wasn't gonna work. And, but it, and, it, and it, it me, kinda it kinda like gave them it made people think, well they're trying to help, right? No, they weren't. That that's not yeah, a successful it, it, plan. And and for me uh, they, they said, okay, all gyms and sport programs closed, but you can train outside as long as you're six feet apart. And I'm like, okay, well, that's terrible. But like us being Canadians, we're, we're, we're like, okay, let's, let's bundle up. And it's like minus 30 degrees Celsius out there. I don't even know what that is in Fahrenheit. Your listeners can look that up. But like I would meet them up at the Rogers Center like, uh, and we'd go for runs around the stadium. I was trying to make it cool. I'm like, okay, let's go for a run around the Rogers Center. You know, there's stairs and different like at, like different hills we can run. It's a pretty cool route. So we were running around the Rogers Center and then we'd go to the Roundhouse Park, a park across the street. And I would do like, you know, I'd practice like for Krav, we would do 360s in the air, shadow box from Muay Thai, different techniques. And I was trying to make it as good as I could, right? And I was yeah. charging like, you know, not a lot per month. It was just like a little bit of life support. It actually got to the point where like, you know, because I still did have those 80 students, I'm like, you can opt in for the outdoor training or opt out. And we're going to be online on these days. You know, online's like 30, outdoor 64. And, and a lot of people wanted the school to come back. So even those that did not even go, they're like, no, I'll opt in. I want to make sure you're open, right? And and then finally, we it, it went on for about two years. And then we had a chance to reopen it. And somehow I got through it. Just the scraps I could get from outdoor training and the CERB, like, you know, you're allowed to make X amount of dollars and still qualify for CERB. So I was making such a little amount that I did qualify for the CERB. So, you know, I was able to just kind of scrounge by for two years. And then you reopen. And it's like, okay, you can only have 10 people in class. You got to stay six feet apart. And I'm like, well, how the fuck do you do martial arts six feet apart? Like, you know, yeah. so again, more shadow box <laughs> style, more innovation and, 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 we just slowly over time as things loosened up we survived and and when i did get back you know i did what i said i the first two months i didn't charge the students okay we're reopened now nobody's charged and and just slowly over time build 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 and then it got to that point where and i'm sure it happened in the u.s where people were made their minds up where it's like okay i've already had it i fought it off i'm ready to live like people got to the point where they're like I'm ready to live, and there's still people that are never coming back from it, and they'll always be wearing a mask in their car with the windows up, and that's fine. Like, yeah, yep. I don't care. But I think, I think people like you know, once it got out that you know you got to take care of your health. Like, I got it, and it was terrible for two days, like really bad, and then I fought it off, and I'm okay. You, you know, like, and somebody else could catch it and they die. Like, I do get that it was real, but it was it was tough, and to go through. Everything I went through in my personal life, along with the COVID and along with getting my ass kicked in the business, I was like, I got through it. Just like I said, like I had those moments where I was sitting there in tears and and I have a little girl that that she needs me. And I'm like, I don't have the option of packing it in and sucking out and boo hoo hoo. This is the world, man. And the world's a cold, shitty place sometimes. And it can be a great place and it can be a shit show. And you're never as high as the highs and you're never as low as the lows and they don't last forever. When you're on a roll and things are great, enjoy it because the shit's coming. <laughs> and when the shit comes, grind your teeth, bear down, get the shit done and get back to the top. And you try to live somewhere in the middle, even keel. That's how I look at things. That's how you have to look at things, right? No matter how great yeah. things are at any moment, it can be taken away from us. But you said something in there that was very important that I hope everybody list- pays attention to. It doesn't last forever, right? No. And, and sometimes we get in this mindset that it's never going to change. I'm stuck where I am, and this is where I'm going to be. And some people don't make it out of that. And I think you know what I'm referring to with yeah. some of the mental health issues we have you know, in the world today. And I just want everybody to understand that 
no matter what you're going through and you your testimony to it, right? You went through the COVID, you went through divorce, selling your home. Barely, all in barely, one, time, one year. Yeah, all all at, all in the same time frame, barely being able to put any food on the table. You had no idea if you were going to keep that be able to keep that school open when and when everything really did kind of kind of relax a little bit. Would you would your school still be there? You know, it says something about you though, Dan, that you had you have loyal people around you and that that's amazing. Yeah. I'm really thankful for that too, right? And like none of the students, none of the staff, none of them ever feel taken advantage of like like those school parties I talked about, right? Like uh, I I'll throw I'll, I'll go to a local bar. There's a local bar around the corner and like, you know, I go to the owner of the bar, I go, Hey man, how would you like to make a lot of money? Sure. And I'm like, okay, well I throw these school socials every couple of months. And when I throw them, like I agree on a price, like per shot of Jameson, <laughs> he gives me a, a dollar figure per shot. And then, uh, you know, we have like the catering menu and I'll buy a whole bunch of food and a round of shots for everybody. And like, you know, okay, you know, thanks for coming out. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of the school. Tonight's for you and celebrate your testing and your Motai achievements, your Krav Maga achievements. And just, you know, this is our night to give back to you guys to show that you're appreciated. And I'll spend a couple of thousand bucks on one of those parties. I, I don't think a lot of people in my position would do that because that's a couple of thousand bucks you can keep in your budget rather than spend it on a round of shots for 40 students and cater a bunch of food. But I think people can see that I'm trying to say thank you. Yeah, they, I'm trying to give back. That's You're probably right. They wouldn't, but that's why you're still open. Yeah, like I, I think little things to show that appreciation, like I hope it does go a long way. And and I'm sure it does. And that's why that, that 80, that 80 the, of the 80 people during the worst times, you look at the names on that student list of the 80, and I'm like, yeah, these are the people that ended up becoming staff that ended up getting black belts that are still there today, you know, that told their friends to come train and they come in and, and then all you needed is an opportunity to get back on my feet. My school has been open for a long time now. It's got a good reputation. I just needed that chance to stay open and get back on my feet. Yeah. And now it, it's with the three programs, it, it's, it's better than it ever has been. All right. So, so I'm, I'm I, I very know thankful. You, I know your daughter's there, so we're going to get wrapping this show up, but I'm, you're, I definitely want you to come back on. You have an open invitation to my show anytime you want to come on. But I do yeah, for I, sure. Yeah, I, definitely. I do have something I want to talk to you about before we end. Yeah. So you picked up you said you picked up cooking, right? So you're you Yes. You like to cook now. <laughs> and I saw you just well, went you didn't you just go and do something with your daughter? Was it at her school or something? Uh, well, yeah, like uh that was funny. She the the, the whole thing is what once me and and well even when i was married i my ex was not the best at cooking with all due respect she stepped up her game a lot over the last <laughs> couple of years but she was not very good at cooking and, and i was pretty good at cooking because i moved out at 20 and like i've never been a mama's boy like you know i like to take care of myself and i have memories my mom with four kids was just so good at cooking and it used to blow my mind how like after working within an hour and a half like, you know, so I remember being a kid being like, when's dinner going to be made? I'm hungry. But instead of eating at like 530 and eating like a bowl of macaroni, we're eating at 730, 8 o'clock. But it's like going to a restaurant. Wow. You know, and like that was like every night my mom cooked amazing food. And, you know, my dad could cook during barbecue season, but that's my dad's stuff. But like my mom was a great cook. And I had memories of watching her. And I loved when she'd cook certain stuff. And, and I just wanted my kid. I'm like, okay, if I don't step up my game, my kid's going to – be growing up eating not the best food, right? So <laughs> ramen noodles it, or something. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just started to really get into it. And again, like we were talking about like education, educating yourself. Like, you know, I'll watch something on YouTube and I'm like, okay, I can do that. Like there's no reason I can't do that. Like that that's the, I can do this. I just got to get the ingredients. And so I, I just really took a lot of interest in it. And it's something that I love doing. And like I got so much better at it over the last couple of years. I've stepped up my game. Uh and my daughter, I, I did the same thing that happened to me when I was a kid. I make my daughter try everything. I'm like, you got to try that. You know, Even if you don't like it, you have to take a bite. Then you can tell me if you don't like it. Right. Like, and I'm like, daughter, well, she'll eat spicy Thai food. We go to the restaurant and she, like, I'm like, hey, you know, you got to make it regular because she can handle it. And she's like, yeah, it's too bland. They got to put spice in it, right? <laughs> so I, for her is really how it started. I wanted to actually be good for her. But, it, you know, I got my mom where I'm like, hey, I'm making like a, a roast, how long should I put this in? Like, I still have her to rely on, but, uh, like I'm, I'm always in there banging off some great food. Like when my daughter's coming over, I'm like, what do you feel like this weekend? Right. And then I'll go out 
and I'll buy all the ingredients. And then like she'll poke her head and she kind of watches. I let her help me and it's something we can do together. And you know, the coolest thing she did, we went to the Rockies in Alberta. I took her to the mountains uh, in Canada, the mountain range that stretches right down, joins into the Colorado Rockies. Like that whole stretch actually goes through Canada and the U S right. So, um, you know, I took her out to the Rockies and we were sitting in a, we were staying in a resort town and um, they had a lot of restaurants and pubs and things nearby. So I told my daughter, I go, hey, I'm like, where do you want to go eat tonight? Right? Because we split our, she splits her time between me and her mom. She's on vacation with me. And the, like the most, like, I, I don't even want to, like, I, I don't want to suck out and like tear up on the phone. But like, you know, I definitely had that moment when I was like, I go, what do you want to eat? And then she's like, I, I want your, I want your food. She wow. goes like, like, I want you to cook. And I'm like, all week? She's like, yeah, I got a week on vacation with you. I want daddy food all week. Oh, that's awesome. And I was like, yeah, like, I was like, oh, okay. So she really is the reason why she makes me cook so good. Like, I I love doing it for her, right? And I I hope I'm giving her the same memories. And what you're talking about yesterday, the bake-off, that was so funny because I I guess uh, with me being able to make my own schedule, you know, we talked about how, I might not make the money I made in corrections, and but yeah. I get freedom and I get to do what I like and I can play around with my schedule. My daughter knows this. So I guess they were doing a baking contest and she had knows I can make my own schedule. So she told her teacher, oh, my daddy can help that day. <laughs> so then she called me and she goes, can you come in and, and help with uh, baking? And I go, like me and you? She's like, yeah. I go, okay. So I had it in my head. I was going to do like a just be there for her, right? So I show up, and I'm a nighttime guy. Like my job, I don't really get home till about midnight. By the time classes end at my Toronto school, it's 10 o'clock. Sit down, you talk to a new student, answer their questions, sign them up. It's 10.30, clock up the gym. I'm leaving, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, now I'm home by 11.30, I walk the dogs. By the time I sit on my butt and like can just relax and unwind, it's like midnight, right? Yep. And so, and, and then I stay awake till like maybe two. That's my schedule. I'm just on a different schedule biologically, right? So I woke up really early to get to the school on time and her school is like an hour away from where I live. So I, I fight through the downtown traffic. I get to her school. I'm groggy. I got a coffee. I show up, foggy brain, and there's like six moms volunteering. I'm the only dad in the room. <laughs> And I show up and I see these tables and her teacher is like, okay, so each one of you is going to be in charge of a group. And I'm like a group. I'm going to get a group of kids. I got to be in charge. of." <laughs> and, and she goes, and some of you are baking banana chocolate chip and some of you are baking something else. And so I, I'm looking at the recipe for the banana. Cho- I'm like, look, man, I can cook. I don't, I don't really bake. They're <laughs> two different things. Yeah. And, and so I'm looking at it and I'm thinking I'm stressing out. And then I get my daughter with these six kids and like this one kid's bigger and he, he's being a bit of an ass. And and I'm like, look, man, I go, you got to help me out. You're the biggest one. And then like, I got all these like different kids. I'm, I'm like, I'm only here for my kid, man. I didn't come here for these <laughs> other kids. And I'm like, all right, kids, listen up. <laughs> this is what we're doing. And then my daughter's like, my daddy's also a teacher and he can cook good. So we got to listen to him. Right. And I just, I had fun. I got the kids into it. And like the big kid, he, he was listening to me and, and the teacher even came over and she goes, he might be difficult. I go, no, he's not difficult at all. He's listening to me. <laughs> That's are awesome. What's that? Now my daughter's here right now. What's that, honey? Um, are you doing a good job on this? I think I'm doing a good job. She came and asked if I'm doing a good job. Doing a I, great I think I'm job. doing a good job. Yeah, so, so it was fun. We, I'm telling about the muffins yesterday. So we had a... Yeah, we 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 uh, did all the work, and uh, you know she she had a good day, and I was able to spend time with her. And again, that's just uh, just memories I try to give her. Like I remember my dad came with me on some field trips, and my dad bought me and my group just like a bar of fudge at a fair and as a parent escort, and I thought it was super cool. Right? Yeah. I was like, oh, my dad's great, right? So I just wanted to do the same thing for her, right? So yeah, I was he's asking me, and I, he's asking me about cooking, and I told him that I love cooking for you. Yeah, cooking's good. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So now she's here. So I guess we'll we'll end it at that because now uh, the little one is back in. So, no, well, we got nothing left to say. We're done. We put in a whole episode. I'll play the episode <laughs> for you when, when uh, my friend Bill gets it up. Okay. All right. If you want, you can say bye to Bill, and then I'll say bye. <laughs> bye, whoever you are. <laughs> All right. Hey, nice to meet you. Bye. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, Bill. Dan, it, it's been great. That was I'm good looking stuff, forward Dan. to hearing the episode. I, I hope that your listeners get a lot out of it. I, I'm going to share it too with uh, oh, the people in my network. And, uh, it, you know, I'm always happy to chat with you. And like, I haven't talked to you since, uh, since COVID. So it's good to catch up and let's yeah. see if the Leafs win tonight uh, with the curse. Let's see if the curse gets lifted. And uh, we'll just uh, we'll keep in touch, and I'll be on again shortly. It sounds good, Dan. Thank you very much for coming on. All right, keep up the great work with your show. The episodes are awesome, and like I said, anybody listening to this episode, if you have fun, click on the other ones because they're, they're all good. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. All right, Bill. You have a good night. I'll you, talk to you later. You too, buddy. Okay, bye. Bye. I'll be remembered, but will you? Phil McDonald's the baddest that I would turn to. CEO with the shit that's a dope motherfucker. You always win. There's no going under. The top of the crown resting on his head. The beast is alive. He'll never be dead. If he drunk before, bring it back to life. Push harder for it. Let us survive. Show courage and strength. It's okay to be scared, but don't let it stop. You always stay prepared. Bill, show me school. They're just not beginning. Winners fucking win, losers. Talk about winning.